How can we make the world better? By making ourselves better. The Dr. Joe Show explores how you can make positive personal change by using his groundbreaking and highly effective I Am approach to understand who we are and why we do what we do. Your small changes can have big effects. Join us now for the Dr. Joe Show with Mark Stiles of Stiles Law and your host, Dr. Joe Schrand. Welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. Very interesting, Mark. That was a very interesting new adaptation to... Why Why do you say? Uh, maybe it was just the, the Zoom link was off, but no, but uh, no, it sounded great. It's still during office hours, so I was being respectful to the others in the office right there, so oh. I couldn't really... I couldn't really give it my all, although I probably could have. I mean, it is it is your office after all. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I, I guess it's my shyness maybe coming out. Oh my goodness, we we will definitely do a show on that. Yeah, just let's to, do that. Just to bring that out of you. Let's do it. <laughs> we'll do it. Yeah, I mean, with that in mind, Tom, could you could you introduce our guest for tonight? Absolutely, Dr. Joe. Tonight, we are honored to have Maya Pearl Salovitz. Maya Salovitz is an American reporter and author who focuses on science, public policy, and addiction treatments. She is best known as the author of Help at Any Cost, How the Treble Teen Industry Cons Parents and Hurts Kids. In 2021, she published A History of the Harm Reduction Movement, Undoing Drugs, The Untold Story of Harm Reduction and the Future of Addiction. Welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. Ah, thank you so much for having me. Welcome, Maya. It's it's such a pleasure. And I, are there other books as well that are even more recent? Um, no, the harm reduction one, Undoing Drugs, is the most recent. Um, right before that was um, Unbroken Brain, um, which looks at addiction as a learning disorder and was my memoir. And there's eight books in total. That's fantastic. And, and that is such an interesting concept. That's a, a real paradigm shift, looking at addiction as a learning condition let's just start there tell me a bit about that sure so um if you think about it like you can't have addiction without learning um you have to find a substance or activity that does something for you and really like that or feel that you need that um and then continue to engage in that substance or activity repeatedly um despite harm so if you don't know what you're addicted to, you can't actually be addicted because you can't seek it. So, you know, when sometimes people talk about, oh, a baby was born addicted, a baby could be born with uh, withdrawal from something like opioids, but that baby just feels uncomfortable. They don't know that they need an opioid. They might think they need mommy. They probably do need mommy. <laughs> but mm -hmm. right. um, the, um, you know, the baby is not going to get out of that crib and compulsively go and buy some drugs, especially since it has no money and cannot talk or mm -hmm. walk. <laughs> right. And so, um, so learning is fundamentally involved. Um, nobody else can turn you into a person with addiction, although some parents who do very abusive things um, have a pretty good shot at ending up with that result. Um, but, um, you know, for the most part, you have to find something that you either like or find that it gives you relief from anxiety or comfort or some kind of relief. Um, and then you have to seek that thing and use it as your primary coping method and come to feel that this is the only thing that makes life worth living. And then um, if you feel that way, you are more likely to compulsively use it despite negative consequences. So that's one way in which learning is involved. Um, another way is, um, you know, another term for learning disorder is developmental disorder. And if you think about it, like all psychiatric and um, psychological disorders are developmental, like, um, and so you can sort of figure out what's going on to some extent by looking at when things happen. So for example, um, something like autism you can generally first see the symptoms in pretty little children, like three, four, those ages. Um, something like schizophrenia or addiction, um, you probably won't see till the late teens or early twenties. And different things are going on in the brain at these times. And this gives you a hint as to, um, you know, where the problem might be located. But if you think about it, um, we know 
that 90% of all addictions start in the teens or early 20s. And about half of them end by around age 35. So there's something going on at that period in life, biologically, socially, um, culturally, all these things. Um, and this makes drugs attractive for people um, at that time, especially so. And this is also when you are learning how to connect with other people, you know, make romantic connections, um, make friends, you know, move beyond the world of your parents. So it's an important time in development. Um, and the brain is primed to receive particular types of information at that point. It's kind of in what is known as a sensitive period. And so anyway, um, that's another, you know, if something 90% of the time happens during a very important uh, sensitive period in development, we can pretty much say, okay, this is probably a developmental thing. Um, so that's another reason um, for looking at that. The other important part of looking at addiction um, as a learning disorder is that in order to get better, you kind of need to learn different skills. Um, and you are in a state where you've come to believe something. It's kind of like your brain has fallen in love with the substance or an activity rather than a person. And the changes that that engenders mean that you feel as though your choices are limited. So, um, you know, if you fall in love, you reset all your priorities around that other person. If you have a kid, you are going to do everything in your power to like take care of that kid. And you are going to prioritize different things. Like you might fall in love with somebody who likes music that you hate. And suddenly right. that music is really good. Um, you know, um, it makes you do weird things. And similarly, um, addiction can often do that. And so when we understand that this is kind of a natural um, process that the brain is prepared to learn, then we can understand a lot more about addiction because while some people argue that addiction is progressive, if you actually look at the data, people are equally likely to recover all along the time during which they are addicted. Now, there are certain things that can make people more or less likely to recover, but the if addiction were progressive, it should get progressively harder to stop, which does not seem to be the case according to the data. Um, so again, this suggests that it's like you sort of attached onto something that you probably shouldn't have attached onto that way, um, but you didn't damage your brain. Now, it's certainly the case that certain substances can damage your brain, but you can damage your brain with those substances and not be addicted to them. And you can also be addicted and have zero damage from the substances. So it is a problem of misguided learning, not a problem of brain damage. And, you know, one of the things that's really difficult about studying the brain is that it changes in response to experience. Like if it didn't, you couldn't experience anything. And so because the brain changes in response to experience, it's hard to tell whether a change is learning, which is usually good, but not always, um, or if the change is pathology. And so this is part of why psychiatry is different from neurology and has a lot harder time defining things because neurology can show specific pathologies, whereas psychiatry cannot. That is very true. Um, the, some, there are some words that, that I think we use a lot that I think contribute to just the concept of pathology. The whole, the I am approach is basically saying there is no pathology. It's, it's a radical change and shift because really a brain is only responding to its environment. You change the environment of the cell, you change the response. So it's important that, you know, that we, we try to look at this again. And you're absolutely right. I, I think there is a learning component. Dopamine, you know, all drugs and alcohol force the brain to make this chemical dopamine is absolutely a learning chemical. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, and and what I think is important about dopamine is we also tend to like oversimplify it. Like, you know, people are like, oh, you should go on a dopamine fast. Well, that would kind of mean you have Parkinson's disease, which we really do not want to have. Absolutely, um, agreed. Dopamine totally agreed. is, it can be about prediction. It can be about learning. It can be about desire. It can be about the pleasure of desire, but it is not the only thing that makes you feel good. No, that's very true, but it's absolutely pleasure. And then there's happiness. And I think, you know, when you talk about love, I think that's that's happiness. That's 
lot of serotonin and oxytocin and all these other chemicals and opioids very and, deeply and opioid. endorphins absolutely and and they they make us you know feel that happiness it's 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 really another thing i'd, I'd like your, your thoughts on is what about this word disorder um does that separate people into these groups that this group is okay that group not so sure i can trust them can't anticipate and predict what they're going to do well i think um i don't have a problem with disorder necessarily i feel like um if something is causing a problem um it is fine to say that that may be a disorder um depending on the context um but i do think for example um i am on the autism spectrum um, and that probably gives me certain aspects of my intelligence and my drive and the way I am. Um, but it also comes with some potential for disabilities. Um, now, those disabilities may be more disabling or less, um, depending on how the social world is. But um, I think it's fair to say that if I'm stuck in compulsive behavior, despite negative consequences, that that is a disorder. And I think, you know, when you understand that you have a particular issue, like, yeah, you could just say, oh, this means I'm bad. I have stigma and it is not good. Or you can say, oh, OK, this means I have a specific issue. What have other people with this specific issue done? Um, and oh, wow, this explains why, like. I'm like obsessed with things and also like have difficulty socializing, like which don't seem like they would necessarily be linked. But when you sort of find out about the whole concept of things, it explains a lot of the weirdness. And so I feel like having a diagnosis or a disorder or some kind of name for something, a label is not always bad. In fact, it can be really helpful in the sense of that, like before I had a label for what was going on with me, I just thought I was bad. Like I put the label bad on me because everybody said, well, like you're supposed to like people. You're supposed to like, like people more than ideas. Um, and you are not supposed to be this obsessive and you're not supposed to be this overwhelmed by things. Um, you know, and I just thought, well, I'm trying not to be that way, but this is how I seem to be. And so when I learned that, oh, wow, there's like lots of other people that have exactly the same collection of weird things. Oh, okay. Like, that's cool then. And also they can teach me how to, um, you know, they and um, other people who've like examined this can teach me how to manage some of these things. Yeah, and I agree. So, so like, yeah. So I think like I'm, I'm cool with disorder, like disease I'm even cool with as long as you define it properly. I'm not cool with chronic progressive frequently fatal disease because that is not the way um, the, that is not what the data shows in the vast majority of cases. Right. Um, but um, I am okay. And that's why I say like learning disorder, um, you could say learning disability, um, whatever like works for you, I'm good with in terms of this. And, and I certainly am not in favor of saying like, oh, people with addiction have a disorder, therefore we should put them in jail because like, why don't we lock up diabetics then? Maya, has your research indicated anything about use starting at an early age versus uh, starting at a later age? Well, this is a very difficult thing to study because um, the people who start using very early tend to be very different from the people who start using later. Um, and so it's difficult to tell causality, but um, you know, people who tend to start early tend to have a lot of stuff going on with them. They mm -hmm. either have developmental stuff that's already kicking in for them um, or they have trauma. Um, they're in a chaotic environment. Um, you know, it's not like a happy little kid finds a drug at age six. That very, very rarely happens. What typically happens is that the people who start super early, like prepubescent, which is rare, um, have like they're in an environment where their parents are doing it and introducing them to it. They're in like a chaotic um, social environment where there's a lot of stuff going on. Now, it could well be the case that introducing a substance earlier in development also itself has bad effects. Um, but it's very hard to distinguish between that and what is going on with people um, who tend to start early. Um, that said, 
you know, the earlier you start, um, the higher the risk is. And there's other sort of developmental pieces to that, which is that if you narrow in on this one thing as your coping device, um, when you're of an age when you should be learning other coping devices, then you're going to miss out on that. And one of the things we do know about brain development and, and sensitive periods is that if you miss a sensitive period and do not get the input that you need, like for example, children who are not exposed to language as infants, they're never gonna be able to learn to speak as well as somebody who has that input during the sensitive period. And this is why like, if you're a little kid and people speak five languages, you will speak five languages. But mm. if you um, try to learn a language when you're an adult, it's work. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, the sensitive period is closed and now you like, it's much harder. It's not impossible. And certainly children who have early deprivation can recover. Um, but if you have really complete early deprivation, it's just never going to be as easy. You're, the amount of repetition that you need to learn is going to be so much higher than you would have needed when you were a baby that it may not even be possible for you to achieve it. So um, again, like there are people who totally get better, but the this is thankfully a very rare situation where a child has zero language exposure. Um, but um, and there's also usually some kind of other severe neglect going on, which kind of confounds some of this data. But the um, the bottom line is that there's a lot of reasons why early use can be problematic. Yeah. And, and I, I think in, in your autobiography, I mean, autobiographies are they're so honest. Um, you had an experience when you were younger that led you to use, correct? So. What do you think? One of the things that we're finding is a lot of it is low self-esteem. When a kid just doesn't feel valued and valuable, those are the kids at, at the highest risk of that first time substance use, which then puts it at a, at a risk for lifelong addiction. Yeah. Panic and I mean, like, you know, I just want to say I used it like 16. I was not like 12. Yeah. Mm, <laughs> yeah. It's a big difference there. Um, but the but yes, I certainly because I was such a weird kid and had such a difficulty, you know, making friends and, and feeling connected. Um, I had so many, so much different interests than my peers. Um, yeah. I like hated myself. And so when I found substances, like two things happened that really felt good to me. One was that, oh, here's an obsession that other people do want to hear me talk about, unlike, say, opera or science fiction, right? Um, and then um, also, I was, um, you know, I had the experience of the substance. And, you know, I had read the electric Kool-Aid acid test. And I was really, I was like, you know, a little bit too young to be an actual hippie. Um, and so I was like, uh, you know, just intrigued by the idea that there were these substances that could, you know, make you feel at one and connected. And, you know, um, so I, I just really wanted to find them and find people who were interested in them. And I did. And that, you know, if I had stuck with like weed and psychedelics, I might have had a very different story. But um, ultimately, because I think of the level of self-hatred I had and that I did not, you know, I, which led to depression and, and I, I just didn't, you know, psychedelics, um, are not very good for escaping, like, because they will focus you generally on the stuff you want to avoid, mm. um, <laughs> things like yeah. alcohol or heroin or cocaine do not have that effect. And that's why they are so much more addictive. Um, because if something does allow you to escape and avoid, um, you know, and psychedelics will just often, I mean, there are a few cases where people do get addicted, but in the vast majority of cases, it's like, this does not work to get me away from what I want to get away right. from. Right. Um, so, you know, but I did not. So anyway, I ended up, it was like the, um, early eighties and, uh, cocaine was enormously prevalent. Um, and I was in the grateful dead scene where it was even more enormously prevalent, um, as well as psychedelics. And so, yeah, so that happened. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the part that's, that strikes me with the story is being on the spectrum, but still wanting that connection. You know, and being aware of that, I mean, that's that's enormous, I think, to to have that awareness. 
that I mean, I think like it's interesting. Um, and I don't know if this is partially a gender difference or what it is, but there are definitely people on the spectrum who like are not interested in connecting. And then there mm. are people who are super interested in connecting, but just crappy at it. <laughs> and so um, you know, it's it it is a spectrum, it's not all the same. Right. Um but also like the thing with females um, is that, you know, we're socialized to be social a lot more than boys are. Um, and so you learn to hide it a lot better and mm. you can hide it a lot better than the boys can. Also because um, girls, you know, develop emotionally earlier than boys, like um, time-wise, um, that also like allows you to hide this kind of stuff better. Um, so it's, it's a complicated thing, but yeah, like, I think like I've known a bunch of people on the spectrum and, you know, some people are just really like as warm and social as like anyone else, but they're bad at it and they like yeah. don't know how to do it. Um, yeah. and then there are some who are just interested in other things. It's really interesting because, um, one part of the whole like drug thing that a lot of people don't get is that if you don't like the drug, <laughs> Like you're probably not going to, now, there are some cases where people get addicted to stuff that they don't like, or where they like it at, typically you like it at first and then you get into problems and you don't like it so much. But, um, you know, when you talk about the like current um, opioid situation, like everybody has this idea that opioids are this super pleasure that like everybody likes. When in fact, only about a third of people who are exposed to opioids actually like the experience. And among that group, you know, less than half of them actually become addicted because first of all, like most people, like this is a story you don't hear because it's a boring story, but like, oh, I had surgery. I, I um, got this opioid. It was the best thing ever. But I realized like, I have a job. I have a partner. I have a kid. I have a dog. I have a cat. Like, I don't want to give that up for this. Like, so just keep it away from me. Like, mm -hmm. I'll take it when I need it in the hospital, but no. Whereas if you don't have something to live for or connections or any of these things, um, then that kind of um, liking really matters. Yeah. I, I, and it's part of our, our human condition. We, we need to be rewarded. We need to have pleasure. I mean, for people who don't, crave reward are usually pretty depressed and they really want reward, but they just don't know how to, to get it. And, and with, with substance use, I mean, we, we know, you know, granted it's more complicated, but the dopamine is released. The dopamine interferes with two other uh, brain chemicals. One of, one of them absolutely is important in social connection and that's oxytocin, which is a neurohormone of trust. It interferes with serotonin which is about depression. So the more you use, the more depressed you get. And then your brain says, what are you waiting for? At least you can get some pleasure. So go use again. And I've had so many patients who are not using to get high. They're using to not get sick. And so part of, part of what you were talking about is, yeah, you can have this prolonged use, but at some point your brain and body may become dependent on that. And then when you not stop using, you get all these awful side effects, sometimes life-threatening ones. I would I would push back on that a little bit just because um I have never met someone with heroin addiction that only kicked once. Um I during my own experience, I went through withdrawal about six times. Yep. Each time it sucked, but yep. um when I went back to using, it was not when I was in withdrawal. I went back to using because I was like, I'm fine. I can do this on weekends. Mm. And so like, I think we overemphasize withdrawal. Um, and I think we, you know, it is certainly the case that, you know, you get tolerant and you need a higher dose and dependence exists. But cocaine um, is a really interesting example because it does not produce physical dependence. Like you, you know, and I really hate the term psychological dependence because I think we're all interdependent and let's not pathologize dependence. Absolutely. Um, but the, um, you know, the problem isn't needing something to function. The problem is needing something to function that is hurting you. Right. <laughs> um, and so I think that like with cocaine, you get the opposite of tolerance to certain effects. 
you get more and more paranoid with lower and lower doses. You get more and more anxious with, you know, it's like if only you would get sensitized to the like pleasure of cocaine, you would never give it up because little and, and smaller and smaller doses would make you higher and happier, right? And so that does not happen because that is not how learning works and that is not how the brain works. Um, but the, um, so I think like it is absolutely the case that, you know, as you get further into an addiction, the drug stops doing it for you the way it used to do it. And it happens somewhat differently with stimulants and depressants. But the, um, I think um, if you, um, if you focus too much on withdrawal and on physical dependence, you end up with a schema that says cocaine is not addictive, <laughs> which, yeah, you know, the eighties, <laughs> they said that the eighties, well, you know, yeah, you don't, yeah. when you quit, like, okay, cocaine's not addictive. Um, and that thus happens the eighties. Right. Um, but, um, you know, also you end up with this idea of everybody on methadone or buprenorphine is still addicted because they still have physical dependence. And you also end up with the idea that anybody who's taking opioids for chronic pain is addicted. And so I am very much in favor of separating out withdrawal and dependence from addiction. Now, they are often parts of it, but the um, if you sort of have this psychological and physical dependence thing, then you get the idea of, oh, it's easy to quit psychological dependence when in fact the psychological part is the hardest part. Yeah. And you also get this stigmatization of people who are dependent on anything from antidepressants to um, opioids. And so I would rather leave those things out and focus instead on compulsive use despite consequences. And is this substance that you're taking benefiting you more or is it hurting you more and if it's benefiting you more great do it as long as you have a clean supply um and if it's hurting you more then you've got a problem yeah the autobiography unbroken brain where did that title come from maya so there's two aspects to that title um one aspect is that i really wanted to get away from this idea of the hijacked or broken brain of the idea that, you know, when you have an addiction, your brain's destroyed. And therefore, you know, a lot of people get very hopeless about recovery when you get this idea that like your brain's broken, right? Um, it's one of the reasons why when you use the term brain disease, when you're talking about addiction, it destigmatizes it in the sense of people like, okay, we don't blame them, but it stigmatizes it more in the sense of that, like, oh my God, these are horrible people who can't control themselves. We better lock them up because they have a brain disease and it's not fixable. Um, so I used Unbroken Brain to get out of that. Um, there was also a Grateful Dead song, Unbroken Chain. Um, hmm. So anybody who is a deadhead will sort of maybe get that there's a little reference there. Um, so um that was why I got that title. And then when I was working on the next one, which is Undoing Drugs, um, I already had an un, so I figured, well, what, let's do another un. Um, and that now, of course, causes me great confusion when I'm like trying to figure out which book I'm talking about. <laughs> I have an un book too, Unleashing the Power of Respect. I, I understand these un things a lot. You know, we're, we're talking about substance use folks. We're talking about changing the paradigm as well. Um, you know, one of my phrases, addiction is not about morality, it's about mortality. It's simply the way the brain works. And we have to move away from this idea that people are bad and broken. And, and you know, you, you, you spoke about the 12 steps and the moral inventory and what that means that implies in some ways that people are not good and not moral. But there was the other, the other part is we talk a lot about treatment, you know, treatment, even the word treatment for me, I, I waver on because it implies there's something broken. And I really don't think people are broken. I really don't think that people are, you know, doing anything other than their best. It might not, might not help them, but they're still at their I am. But what about prevention? I mean, we know that these kids are at high risk for lifelong use if they start using before the age of 18. Um, and that is part of what, what really are focusing on. Mark, do you wanna maybe talk a yes, little bit? Yes, I do. My, my uh, Dr. Joe has created and founded an unbelievable um, 
gosh, what would you call it, Dr. Joe? A, a transformative non-profit. nonprofit. Way. We're not making any profit. Well, a nonprofit, <laughs> uh, uh, but it's but it's 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 a it's an idea. It's a concept that could actually change change the world. And what he has done is he's brought these groups of uh, children. I mean, I want to say they're children um, who have experienced they're teenagers. Substance they're teenagers. teenagers. Well, they're, they're, they're children, though. Well, my, I have children. They're my adult children. I mean, yes. that's the best oxymorons ever, right? And this is my adult child. But anyway, nonetheless. All right. So prevention is the key. And we can all agree prevention. If you can, if you can get to the, to, to the person before they use, that would be the, the greatest uh, gift you can do. And Dr. Joe created this concept, this idea where uh, kids in recovery teach their peers through story. So on stage, they, they act out their stories to their peers, peer to peer. And we've seen that uh, really have special effects on the kids who are both watching, but also, Dr. Joe, you can speak to this, the kids who are presenting, who are yeah. sharing, who know that they're doing good. They're giving other kids the opportunity to not make the same mistakes that they made. Yeah. yeah the, the, the slogan of Drug Story Theater, the treatment of one becomes the prevention of many. So, the kids are also teenagers who I've worked with who are, they learn uh, improvisational theater and then we use psychodrama and they create their own scripted shows about the seduction of addiction to and recovery from drugs and alcohol. And they have been performing them for middle schools and high schools so the treatment of one becomes a prevention of many. But in between each scene, the kids step out of character and they do PowerPoint presentations teaching the audience about the neuroscience of adolescent brain development and why their brains were at risk for addiction. And all the kids in the audience take a pre-show and then a post-show neuroscience quiz. And we're, we're just trying to ask kids just to wait. We're not trying to scare them. I mean, that's never worked. If the brain is going to choose between fear and pleasure to choose pleasure every time. Plus fear is in the same part of the brain where addictions live. So it's like stimulating. That's why the dare stuff has never worked. But if we can use this modality and i think my in some ways i think maybe this applies to you as well one of my other phrases contribute to society to help with your sobriety right would you agree with that that when you're giving your yes your i would definitely you? i mean i think i think there's you have to be really careful with teenagers because sometimes you can glamorize things um and um the way we do addiction treatment, um, a lot of kids who are like smoking pot get put into treatment with kids who are like injecting and they're all told you have this chronic lifelong disease and the kids who are smoking pot are like, well, I have this chronic lifelong disease. I haven't even tried the interesting stuff yet. Yeah. So I think it and, is definitely great to engage peers and everything like that. It is just also important not to engage right. your and, contagion. And, and I tell you, you're absolutely right. That when we were first starting this, that was one of the concerns of the kids because the first scene is the seduction, right? And they were saying, you know, we don't want people to, to think it's really cool. And then because I, I used to run a, an adolescent treatment you know, place. And one of the kids said, well, you know, we have kids on weed right now and I'm using heroin. So he, he said to this kid, you know, and it's in the show, they put it, they, they created a scene that goes in the show. This kid on is in, in the treatment center and he says, I don't need to be here, I just smoke weed, you know? And the kid who was using heroin says, yeah, that's what I started with. And the other kid says, yeah, but I'm not like you. And eventually the kid on heroin says, well, if you're not like me, stop smoking weed. You know, it's, it, there is for some people this progression, but we spend so much time on, on treatment. What, what can we do, do you think, for prevention? Well, I think, I mean, I think it is impossible to prevent teenagers from doing dumb, risky things. I think that part of the brain, that is what they're wired to do. They're wired to piss off their parents and to get out of the home and to seek peers and to seek admiration from peers. Um, so I think 
the better way of doing prevention to me is working on coping skills and all kinds of other things before you even get to anything about drugs. Agreed. Like teaching kids who are like little kids, empathy, connection, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, stuff about, um, you know, basic stuff about things that are symptoms. Um, because, you know, a kid can be depressed and they don't have a name for it and they just hate themselves. Mm -hmm. And so like teaching kids to sort of understand, um, you know, what is typical and what isn't and how to, you know, negotiate those things, I think is super important because I do think kids are going to do dumb things. I also think that that means that they need education around the fact that, you know, Smoking pot is not shooting fentanyl. Um, and there's a very big difference in risk in taking some random pill someone gives you or smoking some weed that someone got from a dispensary. And so if we pretend that these things are equally risky, we are putting our children at serious great risk. And so, you know, I think that prevention has, I, most prevention I feel like is about trying to prevent the aftermath of trauma first ideally preventing the trauma in the first place but if you can't do that prevent you know dealing with those kids before that goes wrong um similarly if someone is developing depression if someone is anhedonic if you know figuring out like what personality that kid has um what traits within that personality are going to put them at risk whether it's anxiety or thrill seeking which most people have one of those or the other <laughs> dominant, not both, because if you're anxious, like thrills are scary. Um, but um, the, um, you know, teaching people on um, how to negotiate that stuff, because, you know, like human beings have used drugs and they have started to use drugs in their, you know, teens and early adulthood forever. You know, cats take catnip. Like, it's like, you know, this is a thing humans want to alter their consciousness. So we can either pretend that this is, these things are bad and these things are good based on, well, racism, but we won't say that. You know, the, um, so I just think like, I do think um, helping teenagers who do have issues share them and narrativize them and help others is enormously good. Um, and I think just being aware of the contagion aspect is also important. I, I really think that if, you know, teenage treatment needs to be completely redone, you shouldn't put a kid who's smoking pot in with their own users. You just mm -hmm. shouldn't, um, yeah. you know, it's not that hard to separate them out. Yeah. Um, you know, and um, the, I also think that, um, you know, Ideally, treatment for teenagers looks like family therapy or individual counseling, not even putting them with other peers where you do have risking the deviancy training effect. Um, but if you are going to do that, yeah, you have to be super careful um, and do it in a way that, um, you know, helps the kids to um, process their experience and understand, um, you know, more. Because I, I just think really like, letting kids know like what the risks actually are and what puts an individual at risk um and how you know because a lot of times like treatment and prevention is often about taking things away and telling people to say no and not offering anything helpful like iceland has done a sort of enormous job with prevention and what do they do nothing to do with drugs they more sports availability, more drama right, classes, right. more music. Well, like right. you know, because, you know. adolescents they really do want three things. They want to take risks, feel pleasure, and be social. And that doesn't that's a setup for addiction, but it doesn't exactly. Happen. And it, it is absolutely not about saying don't do this because that's that's the wrong thing. But moving away from this paradigm that people who use are bad people, it is just. You know, we, we want people to come out for help. No one's going to come out for help if they think they're going to be judged. And this goes back, I think, also to that prevention part, because I, I do agree. Kids who have low self-esteem are at higher risk. 
But what we teach is that at every and any moment, you can remind someone of their value. And whenever you remind someone of their value, you increase your own value. Now you've got a group that can have pleasure, be social, take risks. It doesn't need to be risking your brain, giving that away. So my, we, we're coming to the end of the show. We've got the I am approach, the idea that we're all doing the best we can based on the influence of the four domains, your home domain, your social domain, those two are external and the internal domains of the biological domain of your brain and body and the I see domain. How do I see myself? How do I think other people see me? Because those four domains interact, a small change can have a big effect. We don't need to change everything. Maya, based on what we're talking about tonight, what small change can you recommend to our listeners? Well, it obviously depends on where you're starting from. But I think that um, the whole point of harm reduction is meeting people where they are and that small changes add up. Um, if you are, say, injecting drugs and you start using a clean needle, that is a small change that can enormously protect you from things like HIV, um, et cetera. Uh, so, but that also, once you are like, oh, I can make this change. I'm not a zombie. Like they're saying my brain is hijacked, but here I am, I'm protecting myself from this. Maybe I want to take a bigger change. And so I think that idea is really powerful. And that's how most change happens. Like most people don't suddenly recover. Like they might go to treatment and then slip and go back and all of this. Um, but the change happens slowly, just the way kids grow up slowly. You can't like turn a baby into a teenager overnight. Like it doesn't happen. You can't like become a virtuoso at something without practicing for many years. Like it takes time. And so the small things do add up. So I just see what I would just say is for people to, you know, think about where they're at and the thing that they want to change, do something tiny that's towards that, like make a phone call or whatever it is that can help you get towards that. I, I just think, yeah, that's enormously important. And, you know, we always portray recovery as this like enlightenment and then you're done. And that just isn't really how it works for many people. Um, so it's, you know, slow change can be boring. Um, but, you know, when you come out the other side of it, you're like, wow, like, you know, Two years ago, I couldn't do that. Now I can. This is cool. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's so important. The small change. You're right. You know, using a clean needle is harm reduction. The, the calling someone. The, the other small change that really, I think, has significance is, is the words we use. We, you know, we have this thing about willpower. You know, I, I want my patients to actually have won't power. <laughs> you know, they will use all this. I, I want you to, 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 I won't use that. Just, just that one time and see what happens. You know, we know about brain. We know that, that the impulsive brain is what's driving our use and it shuts down our prefrontal cortex, our ability to think about the future. If you can just wait and anticipate what will happen next if I use, what will happen next if I won't, then we can start rebuilding a lot of those connections that you give away. I think, you know, one of the things I, I when people say, you know, look what I lost. I say, you didn't lose anything. You gave it away and you can take it back. You can take this back. So I think that's great. Small changes, you know, you can't do this all at once. The other truth about the I am is everyone's got one. Everyone is interested through their IC domain, what you think or feel about them, which has an effect on their biological domain, because you know it feels different when you feel respected or disrespected. And you are part of someone's home or social domain. So the second truth, you control no one, but you influence everyone. You get to choose the kind of influence you want to be. Maya Salvitz, author, journalist, influencer, what kind of influence do you want to be? Well, I just would like people to feel a little bit more empowered and a little bit better and to realize that a lot of the stuff you're taught about addiction is just not true and that change really is possible and that 
it's positive. It's not about giving up this or giving up that or any of that kind of stuff. It's about how do I get the stuff I want in my life in a way that works better. And so I just want to influence people. You know, what you said about respect is so critical. So much of addiction treatment and, you know, so much of the way we treat people with addiction is inherently disrespectful. Um, we're just telling them shut up and listen, or this is the only way and you're wrong and your thinking got you here and all of this kind of stuff. Instead of saying like, okay, you're here, I'm here. All human beings have value. How do we help each other be better? And that's what it's about. Not about this, like talking down to people, disrespecting people, coercing people, trying to control them. It's more about like, how do we get to the goals that we all share? And how do we be compassionate and kind and connected as best we can be? And nobody's going to be perfect about that. And, you know, we're all jerks sometimes, but the, um, the important part is to just like try and to recognize that, um, you know, the other person is generally trying to do the best they can. And so how can we find ways to, you know, to make that better? Yeah, I, I, I think it is so important, respect. And, you know, if you think about the words, you know, let's look again at why we do what we do. Let's look again and reverse that. Again, look. Again, to repeat something, look like a spectator. That is respect. We have to look again at why we do what we did based on those domains. Why did we feel so valueless that the only way we could feel pleasure was to use dopamine instead of oxytocin or serotonin and i i i truly believe i i really believe that we can do this we just need to remind each other their value that's that's what everybody wants we all want the same thing which is just to feel valued by somebody else so you're right in in so many of these programs People with substance use, even by staff, are seen as broken. Well, the staff are usually the worst. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's typically like some programs are deliberately designed to break you down. Yeah. Um, they're deliberately designed to say, shut up and listen, because what you did got you here. Um, Set it on. Well, even just like many 12 step rehabs do this. Like, it's not even just like the troubled teen or the their so-called therapeutic communities. Like there is a lot of inherent disrespect in a lot of the way some 12 step based rehabs do their thing because the idea that they have is that this is the only way. And if you don't buy into this way, you're in your disease and that's not respecting the person where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really, I think um, important to, root out all of that stuff that lives in the idea that the person who runs the treatment center is like a god or is superior and can fix the other person you know you're there to offer help and to be able to um be present for this person and maybe teach them something and yeah. this is the other thing i like about seeing addiction as a learning issue like a teacher and a student are in a different relationship than like a dictator and a subject. Um, now you can have some very authoritarian teachers, but for the most part, a student isn't broken. A student is just there to learn something they don't know. And they may know a ton about stuff that the teacher doesn't know anything about. Mm -hmm. It's just in this domain, the teacher knows. Yeah. And that's why, you know, it is about that respect. Respect leads to value and value leads to trust. And that trust is the antidote to that fear and anger and sadness that somebody may be experiencing that drives them to use. So it's all about respect and we can do it. Maya, thank you so much for being on the Dr. Joe Show and for all the work you do. How can people get your books? Uh, so um, Maya SZ, which is M-A-I-A, -A S like Sam, Z like zebra, dot com is my website. Um, and that has links to all of my stuff. Um, 
you could get books from bookshop.org or from any local bookseller or from Amazon or Barnes and Noble or whichever um, book organization you would like to support. But um, if you ask for it, you should be able to get it. And you're also doing a lot of op ads for, for uh, which, which, like some big newspaper. Times, times. Yeah, that's right. Well, just, <laughs> good, good times. Uh, <laughs> So, um, uh, but yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, thank you so much. Thanks so much for being yeah. here, folks. We'll see you all next week. Bye, Bye now.